Welcome back to this second video. Today we'll be talking about sources, types, and the impact of air pollution. The learning targets for this video are to describe the environmental consequences caused by exploiting different forms of energy, to describe the effect of human activities on global warming and solutions that will stabilize Earth's climate, and to apply the components of sustainable thinking to the analysis of real-world problems such as air pollution. Throughout the video, we're going to concentrate on different types of air pollutants. To begin the video, we want to talk about the types and sources of air pollution. First of all, it's important to recognize that there are both natural sources and anthropogenic sources of air pollution, and they come in two primary categories, primary air pollutants and secondary air pollutants. So primary air pollutants are those pollutants that are released directly into the atmosphere, things like carbon dioxide, ammonia, nitrogen dioxide, particulates, volatile organic compounds. Secondary pollutants are those pollutants that form in the atmosphere when primary air pollutants react chemically with one another or with some natural component. So we see here several of those secondary pollutants that are formed. Some of the major classes of air pollutants include particulate matter, and that includes dust, mist, solid and liquid particles that are suspended in the atmosphere, things like black carbon. It includes soil particles, soot, lead, even asbestos microorganisms. Some of that particulate matter has toxic and carcinogenic effects. It can corrode metals, it can erode buildings. It scatters and absorbs sunlight. And those microscopic particles are actually more dangerous to humans because those smaller particles are inhaled and the larger particles are not. You can see two diagrams here. In the top diagram, it shows particulate matter for several states across the United States over time from 2006 to 2015. And the good news here is that there is a general decline in the amount of air pollution in terms of particulate matter by state. In the bottom picture, you can see air masses that are bringing in foreign air pollutants, so particulate matter, and what types of particulate matter those are and where they're coming from. So here in South Florida, we notice that we're receiving dust in the atmosphere from Africa. Some additional classes of air pollutants include nitrogen oxides. These are gases that are produced during combustion and they are a component of photochemical smog and of acid deposition. Sulfur oxides form from the reaction of sulfur and oxygen in the atmosphere, and these play a major role in acid rain. Carbon oxides, we hear about these often, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And then other hydrocarbons, so a diverse range of organic compounds that contribute to photochemical smog, with methane being one of the primary greenhouse gases. The effects of air pollution are serious. Air pollution harms organisms, it damages respiratory tracts, it can cause worsened medical conditions. Air pollution reduces visibility, it can reduce the productivity of crops. In a global society where we have an increasing population and an ever greater need for food, we need to preserve those crops. It's involved in acid deposition, in global warming, and in ozone depletion. Turning now to urban air pollution, the primary type of urban air pollution that we're accustomed to hearing about is photochemical smog. It's that brownish orange haze that hangs just over a city. Photochemical smog is in fact worse in summer months. It requires solar energy to form and ozone is often a primary component of that photochemical smog. If you have a bad air alert day or an ozone alert day, it will cause eye irritation, it can aggravate respiratory illnesses, and it can even harm plant tissues. Weather and topography also impact air pollution. We have two diagrams here. On the left side, we see normal conditions where warmer air is close to the surface and cooler air moves up so that it cools off at higher altitudes. But in a situation with a temperature inversion shown on the right side, that cooler air which is full of pollution, can be trapped by a warm inversion layer just above the surface. So characteristics of temperature inversions include these pollutants being trapped in a layer of cold air near the ground. Typically, this only lasts for several hours, 
but when there is a high pressure system stalled nearby, it can last for days. Temperature inversions are particularly serious in cities that are in valleys or coastal areas up against mountain ranges. Many cities experience the urban heat island effect and dust domes. So we can see in this top diagram here that there's actually a graph with the y-axis being temperature in the late afternoon, Fahrenheit on the left, Celsius on the right. And across the bottom of this, so the x-axis in effect, goes from a rural area to a suburban area, to a commercial area, to a downtown area, and then back towards a more rural region. And you see that in the afternoon, the temperature can increase by as much as seven degrees Fahrenheit from the rural area in towards the city area. In cases of an urban heat island, pollutants build up near the surface, particularly particulate matter. And as the wind blows, it can blow that particulate matter out from the central city area as a plume of pollution seen in the bottom diagram that can be a dust dome that will form over the city initially and then move out towards the rural areas. We do have ways of controlling air pollutants. We're developing new technologies all the time. I encourage you to hop out to other YouTube videos and take a look at some of the scrubbers that they're installing on smokestacks. These are uh, effective in terms of cleaning pollution from the smoke. Also, of course, we have more fuel efficient automobiles with catalytic converters. We're using low sulfur fuels that reduce the hydrocarbon emissions and land excavation activities have been done that reduce those activities as well. There have been federal efforts. The Clean Air Act was passed in 1970. It was amended in 1977 and again in 1990. The federal agency that's responsible for the Clean Air Act is the Environmental Protection Agency. And they are responsible for regulating six different air pollutants, including lead, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, and ozone. The impact of the Clean Air Act has been to have a 98% decrease in atmospheric lead since switching to unleaded gasoline, and that sulfur dioxide emissions have declined by 83% between the years 1980 and 2010. And the EPA, again, is charged with regulating CO2 emissions, and this was as a result of a 2008 U.S. Supreme Court ruling. In the diagram here at the bottom, you can see 1970 values for carbon monoxide and several other air pollutants in brown, and in green, you can see the 2014 data. Air pollution around the globe, so we talked a little bit about the efforts in the United States, but what has happened globally? The top left diagram shows deaths attributable to urban air pollution in 2004. The darker the purple color, the higher the number of deaths. So you can see that even in North America, we're in a mid-range color here, but there are lots of places globally where there are dire circumstances. On the top right diagram, you can see the global exposure to particulate matter pollution. So some general things here to remember. Developing countries produce more air pollution as they become more industrialized. Environmental quality is a low priority in their race for economic development, and they don't have air pollution laws or they're not strictly enforced. Low quality coal is often burned for heat and for industry in many industrialized countries, adding to that particulate matter. There's a growing number of cars, more people, more cars on the road, and respiratory disease is the leading cause of global death for children. Indoor air pollution is a problem as well. In developing countries, things like wood, coal, peat, and even animal dung are used to cook indoors with poor ventilation. This creates tremendous amounts of particulate air pollution. In fact, the World Health Organization estimates that 1.6 million die annually from indoor cooking smoke, and those are mostly women and children. In developed countries, the most common indoor air contaminants are radon, cigarette smoke, carbon monoxide, carbon nitrogen dioxide, and others. In fact, viruses, bacteria, dust mites, pollen, and other organisms are found frequently in ventilation ducts. You've probably heard of sick building syndrome. This causes eye irritation, nausea, headaches, respiratory infections. And the Labor Department estimates that more than 20 million employees are exposed to health risks from indoor air pollution in buildings in which they work. 
I think we're ready to check on our learning targets here. So we talked about environmental consequences caused by using different forms of energy. And we talked about stabilizing Earth's climate and the impacts of air pollution on Earth's climate. And we talked about real world problems related to air pollution. So go ahead and take your mastery check quiz and I'll see you in class.